morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Congratulations on your child. I have a note written, but I haven't mailed it yet. So can I? Um, what was I going to ask? Are you it with your? Who are you ushering? With? This great little brother. Hey, man. You need a. Right there. Do you feel good about that? Yeah. Yeah, you need a new suitcase, dude. Okay. Yeah. Hey, can you can you pick it up next week, maybe? As she makes her way from the back alley up to the front, grace and peace to you and welcome in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's good to be in the house of the Lord on this Trinity Sunday when we celebrate God in three persons. Barbara Bucheris and I were uh, delivering extended communion this week and we were sharing some of the text for today and it was kind of funny because we got to learn about how different people understand the Trinity as we delivered communion. But today is Trinity Sunday and we look forward to worshiping together. We have a couple of announcements to share with the church. You've been hearing about garden to guns to gardens for, thank you y'all, um, guns to gardens for quite a bit of time now. Well, this event is upon us. Saturday, June 9th, which is this coming Saturday, there will be, Saturday, June 10th, thank you, we will, um, at Good Shepherd Catholic Church, there will be an opportunity to, for folks to surrender guns. This is an ecumenical effort that we're working on together. Um, I have an aunt who has her grandfather's rifle from probably the late 1800s. She keeps it under her bed without any kind of ammunition in it, but it's just the security piece. But this is an opportunity where people could surrender guns if they needed to. For example, like my aunt, it would be an excellent opportunity for her to easily put that into safe hands and have that um, gun transformed into a garden instrument. So that is this Saturday. Thank you, June 10th. Um, also, we had some petition signing after worship. And um, if anybody still would like to sign that petition, or if you need to still do that, if you will see me after worship, I'll help you make that happen. I will help you make that happen. This is indeed the day that the Lord has made. So let us rejoice and be glad in it as we are prepared to worship.
able, please stand and join me. Please rise in body or spirit and join me for the call to worship. I want one note before we go into our first hymn as well. If you'll notice, we are not singing verse 4 and that the choir alone is singing verse 5. But later in the service, we're all going to sing verse 5. Just for awareness, this is part of teaching us a new song that we'll sing through a season in the summer. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Alleluia.
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, glory to you forever. Speaker, word, and breath of life, glory to you forever. Font of blessing, living water, flowing river, glory to you forever. Compassionate mother, beloved child, life-giving womb, glory to you forever. Sun, light, and burning of ray, Glory to you forever. Giver, gift, and giving. Glory to you forever. Lover, beloved, and love itself. Glory to you forever. Rock, cornerstone, and temple. Glory to you forever. Consuming fire. Dividing sword. Overpowering storm. Glory to you forever. Rainbow of promise, ark of salvation, dove of peace. Glory to you forever. God who was, God who is, God who is to come. Glory, glory to you forever. Creation displays the glory of God, but our sin keeps us from rejoicing in the love God reveals. Yet Christ Jesus, the Son, carried our sins to the cross, and the Holy Spirit breathes new life into us so that we can praise God, our Maker, Savior, and life-giving lover. Let us confess our sins that we may receive such grace. Presence, life, fire. God, who is three in one, we confess that we have turned away from you. We gaze upon ourselves as if we are worthy of worship. We take your creation into our hands, not to love, but to use and then to discard. We go to the people of the land not to serve, but to press them into our service. We do not deserve that you would even notice us, but we pray for mercy because you are merciful. Flame of love, purify us from sin. Eternal now, lead us to your truth. Risen one, baptize us into union with you. Transform us into faithful disciples who worship you alone. God who is Trinity. Hear the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. Amen. Having been forgiven in Christ Jesus, we can turn and look at one another and say, the peace of Christ be with you, and also with you.
we will read the prayer for illumination responsibly. Sing into our ears, O Spirit, the holy word of life. Tell us, Tell us who, who we are and, and to whom we belong, so that we may live with gratitude for, for all that you have done. Amen. The first lesson is from Genesis, all of chapter 1, into chapter 2, verse 4. When God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was complete chaos, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome, and it was so. God called the dome sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years and let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make humans in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth 
and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humans in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, see I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. On the sixth day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it, God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm is Psalm number eight. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens, out of the mouths of babes and infants. You have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The hymn is hymn number 20, All Things Bright.
You may be seated. It's not every day, it's not every Sunday that we get to hear the whole of the creation narrative read. So Darlene, you had a hard task today. And I think it's important that we trust that the spirit will move in us when we hear the whole of the story, that there was evening and then morning, that very first day that brings us to today. Our gospel reading this morning is the commission from the end of the Gospel of Matthew. It's Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. So listen now to a word from the Lord. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, and they doubted. And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you to the end of the age. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. Rachel Carson's book, A Sense of Wonder, was on our coffee table growing up. The book records her adventures along the rocky coast of Maine with her nephew, Roger. As a child, I, I loved the pictures in the book. I loved seeing a child and adult walking hand in hand along a water's edge. I liked the image of a child and an adult in a field of wildflowers, but you can tell they're just studying the perfection of one little bloom. I appreciated and made meaning from those images, but also I think it was because I knew my parents valued this book. We were not a people of means, and to have a fancy book that didn't come from the library, but that sat out for all to see who came to your house, it meant that this book meant something. It carried an important story. Carson, who was an early environmentalist, said, if a child is to keep alive, their inborn sense of wonder. They need the companionship of at least one adult who can share it, rediscovering with them the joy, the excitement, the mystery of the world that we live in. And Carson went on to say, drawing her work as an environmentalist into the work of the church and baptism, though I will say, she misnames the Holy Spirit as the good fairy. <laughs> so listen with that in mind. If I had influence with the good fairy, who is supposed to preside over the christening of children, I should ask that her gift to each child in the world would be a sense of wonder so indestructible that it would laugh, last throughout life. The gift would be a sense of wonder so indestructible that it would last throughout life. Trinity Sunday today follows Pentecost. The Spirit is a work amongst us. It has included the wonder of the creation narrative, and it also includes the commissioning of the first disciples. You might have noticed that our worship began with a litany. 
words that are biblically framed about how we understand who God is, who God was, who God is, and who God is to come. A way to understand a triune God, God in three persons, whenever I was teaching confirmation, we'd have children, we'd have the kids write faith statements and often they would say, the first part of the Trinity is God. The second part of the Trinity is Jesus. The third part of the Trinity is the Spirit. And I was like, there are no parts to God. There are persons, the three persons of the Trinity. So a way to understand a triune God, God in three persons, three persons in one, is like Carson's desire for indestructible wonder. A way of wondering, of being curious, of exploring how God in three person works in the world. And this way of understanding, it has more in common with the artist The artists, like the poets, who say it's their job to stand at the window and watch the world unfold, to pay attention, to engage in our senses. In her book, Small Wonders, Barbara Kingsolver says, I am a scientist who thinks it wise to enter the doors of creation, not with a lion tamer's whip and chair, but with the reverence humankind has traditionally summoned for entering places of worship, a temple, a mosque, or a cathedral, a sacred grove as ancient as time. A way to understand a triune God is like the desire for indestructible wonder, entering a sacred grove as ancient as time. Proceeding today's gospel reading, the women had come to the grave to retrieve Christ's body, to prepare him for burial. And instead they encounter an angel who says, don't be afraid, he's not here. Come and see, this is where he was laid, he's not here. And go and tell the folks to meet me in Galilee. The women are astounded, amazed, but then they move to tell those others. And Jesus comes among them and gives them the greeting. Greetings. And he says the same thing that the angel of the Lord said. Don't be afraid. Go and tell the people to meet me in Galilee, where I said I would go. Entering creation literally living on earth as people who have faith in a triune God. It really asks us to set aside the lion tamer whip and chair and to instead put on an indestructible sense of wonder. It's like this gift that I'm wearing on my stole today. (laughs) The wonder of the scent of our gardenia. When I submitted my statement of faith to my theology professor, something we have to do to be ordained, and I wanted my theology professor to read it so it was right, right? I gave him a printed copy and I said, would you read this and give me some feedback before I take it to my presbytery? Well, we sat down in the refectory and I got back a really red-lined copy is what I would tell you. And he said many things, but there was one that really stuck. And this is supposed to be a personal statement of faith, and it reads more like an academic treatise. And with the red pen copy, he wrote several times, and Anne, what do you believe about sin? Your own sinfulness, the sinfulness of humanity. And Anne, What do you believe about the redemption through Jesus Christ's love? And Anne, do you really believe in the church? Or do you believe in God? And that leads you to understand the importance of the community 
of the body of Christ called the church. Lots of red lines. But how do you make it yours? what you really believe about who God is in Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. What this professor was asking me to do was to set down that lion tamer's whip and chair of doctrine and to instead put on an indestructible sense of wonder. When the disciples come to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them to go, the first thing they do when they see Jesus is this odd and wondrous combination of verbs. They worship and they doubt. They worship and they doubt. And right there in that holy space, Jesus commissions those gathered for a life of discipleship. (laughs) These disciples, they're like us. They were tethered by the strands of worship and of certain disbelief. But they hear a commissioning word about how to live their lives. I love that Christ works in the midst of worship and in doubt. That Christ makes room for doubt. And that's part of our story together. The words that Jesus speaks to these disciples to commission them are the words that we speak every time that we come to the font and we do a baptism. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This means that Jesus is saying to those gathered that the focus of our life together, it's on Christ the wonder of Christ, Christ who turns water into wine, Christ who heals the long-suffering, Christ who bends down and writes in the dirt to teach about sin, Christ who loves so freely that he dies that we might have life. Christ's power is in the power of a triune God. Christ who gathers disciples together in and under the authority of a triune God. Then he says, go. Go and make disciples of all nations. Not just the people you like, not just the people that look like you, That means that we are sent into the wonder of moving among all peoples, not just the people that we are most comfortable with. We are to risk ourselves in Christ's love. We are to proclaim Christ's love, justice, and mercy. We're to make space and make places for ceaseless love to be revealed. Here's another theologian's way of putting it. We are to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. And then Jesus says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. (laughs) Y'all, that means there's something new about how we live our lives of discipleship. And that newness is something that we need to share every day, that we are washed in this wondrous three-person God-flowing waters. And that means we have to live in the world in a new way. And at the baptismal font, when we say this, I always think maybe we forget the rest of this. Just baptizing, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But these two extra ands are really important and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded. Speaking to a bunch of faculty members from Florida State, that means we have a role as educators. We are to be educators in the uh, wonder and the obedience of Christ-like love. That means that we're sent to be teachers teachers of obedience to a still more excellent way, which is Christ's way in the world. 
I was driving carpool with some preschoolers and elementary school kids a while ago, and I just asked the question, because they were all church kids, I was like, hey, y'all, what do you know about who God is? Like, who's Jesus to you? Talk to me about the Holy Spirit. You know, this is what pastors do in carpool. <laughs> who is God like? And one of them responded, God is like a butter knife, can smooth the yummy stuff of love all over, but has a sharp pointy end if you're not doing it quite right to poke you with. <laughs> now, I think maybe they were thinking about a fish knife with a wide blade with a point on the end. Not a butter knife, but we have some teaching to do about love in the world. And an obedience to that love. And it isn't easy. And then this last and. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. That means on this journey together, we are never alone. We always have God's peace and God's presence. Like those early disciples, they came together and they worshiped. Now what makes us maybe unique from those first disciples is we've entered into the land of denominationalism and we are specifically Presbyterian in the ways that we worship. And even as we worship as Presbyterians, the doubt can come alongside. Our worship has space for freedom in that it is always word-centered. You might notice in the ways the bulletin is organized. We gather in the word. That's when we do the call to worship, the call to confession, the prayer to confession. We gather, or God gathers us together as a community before God in worship. We ask God for forgiveness for the tyranny of our idolatry and our sinfulness, and we're reminded of the assurance of God's forgiveness and the peace that Christ gives. That's as we gather in the word. And then we proclaim the word. Darlene, you proclaimed the word this morning, a very good word about the goodness of God's work in creation. Before we hear that word proclaim, we ask for the spirit to illumine our hearing, that our hearts and our minds might hear something new in hearing the word proclaimed. We hear readings from scripture. We hear one, we hear many. They may be sung, they may be spoken responsively, they may be dramatized, they could even be danced. But we hear the proclamation of the word. And then we seal that word. And in the Presbyterian church, we do that in two ways. Here at the table, we have a table, we do not have an altar. We are served the Lord's Supper, communion, the Eucharist. Maybe you know it in different words. But this is Christ's table, and Christ invites us to his table that we might be fed so that we can go and serve with that wonder of love. That's one way we seal the word, is at Christ's table. The other is at the font. Baptism is one way that God's word is sealed. That's why we remind ourselves in the assurance of pardon as we pour the water and we hear the water poured. We are reminded of the ways that we are sealed in God's covenant of grace. We also can respond to God's word in worship. We might speak a confession of faith or a portion of a confessional statement we offer ourselves and all that we have for the grace that God has given when we collect the offering. We often commission those who will serve or have served by giving thanks to God for those who have served faithfully in the church. Last week, you might have noticed, we moved Ethan into a formal role of service in the church. We commissioned his ministry among us. That was a way of responding to God's word in this place. And then in the end, we are sent with God's word. We sing and we're charged to move out into the world with Christ's love. Worship is a wondrous 
thing. And Christ has commissioned us to worship, even in our doubt, that we might come, that we might be fueled, that we might leave this house of worship prepared to serve. Might it be so. Amen. This morning, our prayers are being offered for Bob Picard, brother of Mary Vance, Tara Reynolds, Jody Kim Jardine, Martha Miller, Sandra Sherrard, Ben Powell, Diana Bruno, and we give thanks for the recovery of Bill Kennedy from his bad knee injury, and we pray for continued healing. Wayne Friedman, Elise Bokman, sister of Erin Rossica, Leah Yates, mother of Mary Codrick, Emily Landreth, Michelle Chasen, daughter of Rich Payton, Sally Scott. Our prayers for strength and mercy are offered for Louise Clark, aunt of Jim Rossica, and also for Jim's mother, Arlene, Jan O'Neill, cousin of Greta Reed, Patricia McCoy Delancey, Thaddeus Gillen, Myrna McGowan, Aidan, grandson of Sue Safford, Monique Ellsworth and the staff and volunteers of Second Harvest of the Big Bend, the people of Ukraine, Pastor Izette Sama Hernandez, and the Presbyterian Church in Cuba, the churches of the Presbytery of Florida. We're praying for those in military service, including Jonathan Babineau, Brian Giso, Ross Yielding, David Del Rossi, Owen Elsie, and we celebrate those who are preparing to be married, including Kellyanne Kennedy and Zachary Broadway. As we come to call for the offering this morning, I would invite you to pull out your hymnals, please, if you would do that right now. And if you would turn to hymn number 643. We love to give thanks to God with verse number one, but today as we sing the doxology, I'm going to invite you to sing verse number three. That will be our doxology today. So, and we will sing this through the summer season as our doxology, this third verse, but just so today we have just a little uh, change from the words that are printed in your bulletin, if you would sing verse three, and there will be an amen. Freely we have received, freely let us give.
Thank you, God, for being with us, and thank you for the ways that you care. Take these gifts that have been collected and use them for the common good. In Christ, with God, and the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This is not First Presbyterian's table. This is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ who invites us to come to taste and see that the Lord is good. We invite those of you who are at home to prepare your elements that you might share in this meal at Christ's table with us today. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Thanks and praise to you, O God, creator and lover of the universe. You created all that was, you nurture all that is, and you imagine all that will be. You are the pattern of community. Three in one, God of mercy. From the beginning of time, you have created us for relationship with one another, with the earth, and with you. When we reject your call to community, choosing isolation over partnership and brokenness over healing, you call us back again and again with words of grace and the promise of new life. Remembering that we are not alone at this table, we join our voices with all the saints with whom you have called from all times and all places who forever sing your praise. We give you thanks for Jesus Christ, our host and our guest at this table. Through his birth, you took on flesh, affirming the goodness of our bodies and our world. Through his life, you took on suffering, sharing the truth of hope and desperation. And through his death, you took on death, revealing the depth of your love for us. Through his resurrection, you brought new creation, embodying the promise of life everlasting. It was during the week that our Lord was anointed by a woman, and on the night that he was betrayed, that he took bread and he broke it, and he said to those gathered there with him, Take, eat, and do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and said, This is the cup of the new covenant, my blood poured out for you, shed for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, remembering me. Every time that we take and we eat from that loaf and this cup, the gifts of earth through which Christ the Lord blesses, Christ blesses us, and we offer ourselves in your service. your Holy Spirit upon us, O God, and upon these gifts of fruit and grain, that we may taste your goodness, see your presence, and become one with you in your body. 
Conform our wills to your will. Open our minds and enlarge our hearts. Renew our hope and strengthen us in faith until we feast together at your table in glory. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, forever and ever. Let us pray for God's rule of love on earth as Jesus taught us, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
out from this table into your beloved world to share your life, your love, your grace with all. Blessing and honor and glory to you. Holy, holy, holy Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen? Amen. Will you please be seated? And Kathy Winstead, I would just ask that you please come forward. This is that part about responding to the word. So y'all, this is my friend Kathy Winstead, and she's been communicating for the church for over a decade. Holy, holy, holy has been her discipleship for the life of the church. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen? amen. And so, Kathy, we have a little something to say thank you to God, to say thank you for your discipleship that has been faithful to the church. So we've been sneaking around. Yes, you have. And this is a heart because of the way your heart has served the church. And it's made out of, it's a piece of bricolage, which is the new word I learned. But it's words put together from newsletters and previous newsletters. And then this inside the heart, drawn from prayer and the words you've just religiously put together, 
follow the welcoming gifts for hope. I believe that what, that's what Kathy's done for this church. It requires compassionate grace, particularly to one pastor that served for six months and three weeks and never turned an article in on time. Praise be to you who said to me, time is a human construct. We made it work out. <laughs> compassionate and grace being the best part of that. Grateful for both the familiar and the new. Remarkable, y'all, every week, even on holidays, I learned the hard way. Joyful, yes, it's been a joyful journey, I hope, I pray. Soli gratia Deo, only for the glory of God. So we offer this gift to you, and I will say that also tucked into this are words from the previous staff specifically for you so you can go and discover those things at your leisure and then because I don't expect that you'll stop writing <laughs> or uh, the work that you do so faithfully and in such great service so my father is a woodworker in his retirement and we thought a nice pencil because you might need to erase sometimes because everything we write the first time sometimes needs a little editing don't don't we know that and so this is a pencil that my father has crafted for you out of wood that comes from Jerusalem, from olive wood, that is sustainably resourced. Thank you, First Presbyterian, for making me a better person. Um, but here's what I want you to hear is thank you. Thank you. May the Lord bless you and keep you as you move into this new way of serving God in this house. And would you like to say anything? I'll step out of the way. If I can. <laughs> Thank you all. As I said and when I left a message in, thank you for all the work you do and your outreach to our community and to our brothers and sisters here at First Church that give us something to put in a newsletter. Amen. One other thing. On this Trinity Sunday, if you think God may be calling you to do something, I urge you to seek God in prayer and listen for the Holy Spirit. And if you feel God is calling you, know that God will never call you to something for which you have not been prepared. And I know that from this ministry. <laughs> and may that serve as our blessing. And we join me at the back door, please. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen.